Fairview Clothing Store, Walter Brown, proprietor. A good little business, all my own. I was a, how do you say it legally? Single proprietor. That's it. I ran the store the way I wanted to. I could do as I pleased. And I collected all the profits. That's the way to run a business, on your own. A single proprietor. But you had difficulties in your one-man store. Your good location attracted business. More business than you could handle alone. Besides waiting on customers and receiving and stacking goods on the shelves, you had paper trouble, sales slips, bills, invoices. Man, did you need help. And suppose you got sick. Where would your one-man business be? Not only did you need the kind of help you can't hire, you needed additional capital to carry a larger variety of goods. I needed partners, you said. Now I'm on the spot because of partners. Walter, I still say a partnership was best for your kind of operation at that time. You remember, it was fairly simple once we found the right people, dependable men who had cash to invest and could do some of the work you needed. There was Baker. He had saved a little money while he worked ten years as an accountant for a wholesale company. You knew you could trust Baker. He'd make a good partner. He'd invest his cash and work as an accountant for a share of the profits. And then there was Johnson. He could also invest a little money. And his experience as a clothing buyer for another company made him a valuable partner, too. We knew they'd work hard for the business because each had a personal interest in making it go, as well as the ability to do the work that had to be done. So you were partners in the Fairview Clothing Store. And with their cash and their help, you were able to expand a little, take on some additional lines of goods. Yes, I think your partnership has done quite well. I suppose so. At least we did well, until Johnson made the deal for those expensive modern fixtures and new storefront, and signed commitments for more than our ready cash. He was just talked into more than we can handle right now. We'd like to modernize the store like that. But where is the money coming from? Johnson signed the contract. I have to pay for it. Even though I'm the biggest investor in the store, I can't cancel a contract for all that custom-made equipment. It's just lucky for this whole partnership that I can scrape up a little more money to invest in this store. But I don't want this to happen again. What can I do? Can I get rid of my partners? Own the store myself again? You can't afford to buy them out now, can you? No, and I don't know that I want to with that. The store needs all three of us. Everybody makes a mistake once in a while, but I just can't be personally responsible for another one. That's one of the weaknesses of a partnership, isn't it, Sid? Well, maybe you'd better incorporate the store. Incorporate? Yes. Issue stock to each partner in proportion to the amount of his investment in the store. With more than half the stock, you would have a controlling interest. Voting control of the corporation which owned the store. You'd share your profits with the others in proportion to their stock ownership. Wait a minute. Issue stock, controlling interest. That sounds like a lot of paperwork. Red tape. Oh, it does get a little complicated. And you may as well know there are other disadvantages. You'd be paying special taxes. You'd be subject to new regulations. But incorporating would give you the big advantage of what you want right now. Limited liability. Look, here's how it works. You start with a group of people who want to invest their money in a company. Then these people apply for a charter as a corporation. The state government issues a charter to that corporation. Now that corporation operates legally as an individual person. It is not a group of people. It is under the law a legal entity, or the same as one person engaged in business. And that person is responsible for the debts and... Look here a moment. 
Here is the Fairview Clothing Store as it is now, with the three of you as partners. Suppose you all agree to dissolve the partnership and incorporate. The stockholders will elect a board of directors. In this case, as large a stockholder, you can select a board of directors, yourself and your partners, who will vote to make you president of the corporation. Little and complicated. But if you say it's necessary, and it will let me, the corporation, what to do, I'm in favor of it. And it will mean that none of the stockholders can be held liable for any more than his original investments. Sure. That's what we mean by limited liability. Well, then, I think it's a good idea. I do, too. As a matter of fact, I was thinking I'd like to put some money into Fairview Clothing Store Incorporated. Looks like a good investment to me. Maybe you'd like to invest enough to pay for this equipment and decorating? Well, uh, the amount involved would still leave you with a controlling interest. I'll do it. Let's see if we can get your partners to agree to incorporate. Recently, the United States Supreme Court decided a big case about political speech. Political speech is considered the most protected form of free speech under the Constitution. The case was Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. The question was this. With political speech, do corporations have the same rights as people? By a vote of five to four, the conservative majority on the court decided yes. Companies, labor unions, and other organizations may now spend as they wish on independent efforts to elect or defeat candidates. The ruling is based on the idea in the United States and many other countries that a corporation is a legal person. Historian Jeff Sklansky says a slow shift to personhood for American companies began with a Supreme Court ruling in 1819. It said states cannot interfere with private contracts creating corporations. In the ruling, Chief Justice John Marshall described a corporation as an artificial being that is a creature of the law. The ruling was unpopular. It came as Americans resisted big corporations like the first bank of the United States, chartered by Congress. Some states passed laws permitting themselves to change or even cancel corporate charters. After the Civil War in the 1860s, the 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution. It provides that no state may deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. If a corporation is legally a person, then states cannot limit corporate rights without due process of law either. At first, corporations were not fully recognized as persons, but Jeff Sklansky at Oregon State University says that changed. He said the general direction of the Supreme Court and the federal courts was to recognize corporations as persons with the same 14th Amendment rights as individuals. Yet corporations have a right that real people do not, limited liability. For example, a corporation can face civil or criminal fines and individual lawbreakers can go to jail. But limited liability means the actions of a corporation are not the responsibility of its shareholders. Jeff Sklansky says the 19th century development of limited liability helped shape the modern corporation.
You can roughly locate any community somewhere along a scale running all the way from democracy to despotism. This man makes it his job to study these things. Well, for one thing, avoid the comfortable idea that the mere form of government can of itself safeguard a nation against despotism. For big business, despotism was often a useful tool for securing foreign markets and pursuing profits. One of the U.S. Marine Corps' most highly decorated generals, Smedley Darlington Butler, by his own account, helped pacify Mexico for American oil companies, Haiti and Cuba for National City Bank, Nicaragua for the Brown Brothers Brokerage, the Dominican Republic for sugar interests, Honduras for U.S. fruit companies, and China for Standard Oil. General Butler's services were also in demand in the United States itself in the 1930s, as President Franklin Delano Roosevelt sought to relieve the misery of the Depression through public enterprise and tougher regulations on corporate exploitation and misdeeds. More power to you, President Roosevelt. The entire country's behind you, thrilled with hope and patriotism. But the country was not entirely behind the populist president. Large parts of the corporate elite despised what Roosevelt's New Deal stood for. And so, in 1934, a group of conspirators sought to involve General Butler in a treasonous plan. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government. But the corporate cabal had picked the wrong man. Butler was fed up with being what he called a gangster for capitalism. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men, which would be able to take over the functions of government. A congressional committee ultimately found evidence of a plot to overthrow Roosevelt. According to Butler, the conspiracy included representatives of some of America's top corporations, including J.P. Morgan, DuPont, and Goodyear Tire. As today's chairman of Goodyear Tire knows, for corporations to dominate government, a coup is no longer necessary. Corporations have gone global. And by going global, the uh, governments have lost some control over corporations, regardless of whether the corporation can be trusted or cannot be trusted. Governments today do not have over the corporations the power that they had and the leverage that they had 50 or 60 years ago. And that's a major change. So governments have become powerless compared to where they were before. Capitalism today commands the towering heights and has displaced politics and politicians as the new high priests and reigning oligarchs of our system. So capitalism and its principal protagonists and players, corporate CEOs, have been accorded unusual power and access. This is not to deny the significance of government and politicians, but these are the new high priests. Recently, there's been a string of horrendous crimes involving death, money laundering, and the destruction of public property running rampant through the U.S. The worst part is that many of these offenders haven't faced real justice for what they have done. These criminals may not be whom you expect because they're corporations. Most are just made to pay a small fine for what they've done and then go on with business as usual. Corporate charter revocation is a way for the public to hold these repeat offenders accountable. Offenders like BP, Massey Energy, and HSBC who have gotten away with some of the worst crimes in recent history. The first repeat offender is BP. Most wanted for environmental and economic devastation, BP has committed hundreds of crimes including the Deepwater Horizon spill, the largest oil spill in U.S. history that dumped 4.9 million barrels of oil in the Gulf of Mexico. 
Although BP has been fined around $4.5 billion to be paid over five years, if their yearly profit of about $25 billion stays the same, less than 3% of what the company makes will go toward the fine. BP tripled its spending on ads in the three months after the disaster. Corporate criminal number two is Massey Energy. Massey has engaged in repeated violations of law, contributing to the deaths of 29 people in a coal mine explosion in April 2010. Investigators later wrote over 100 pages on how Massey repeatedly placed profits ahead of workers' safety and compliance with the law, and how this lack of safety culture took the lives of these miners. Massey's CEO, Don Blankenship, retired in 2010, and walked away with a retirement package worth over $80 million. In November 2014, a federal grand jury indicted Blankenship on four criminal charges. Meanwhile, he remains free, and Massey has been acquired by another energy company. Corporate criminal number three is HSBC. HSBC admitted violating money laundering laws covering $200 trillion in transactions. With customers, including terrorists and Colombian drug lords, one might expect a criminal prosecution. Instead, the Justice Department opted for a financial settlement of $1.9 billion, which is about five weeks of income for the company. Their bonuses were clawed back, partially. When people commit crimes, they can be sent to prison. Or worse, why are these businesses allowed to continue their activities when they've shown they have no concern for people, property, or the greater economy? A corporation's very existence depends on the public. It is created when a state government, which could be any state but for most major corporations is Delaware, issues a corporate charter. This is a legal grant of power and privilege from the state to the corporation. If a business continues to break the law, this charter should be taken away. This process is called corporate charter revocation. This is usually done by the Secretary of State or the Attorney General of the state that issued the charter. If a corporation that's incorporated out of state abuses its privileges in your state, its license to do business there can also be taken away. States have revoked corporate charters and business licenses for out-of-state corporations in the past by the will and pressure of the public. That's where you come in. Most people don't know about corporate charter reform, and they don't know that it's possible to deliver this just punishment that companies like BP, HSBC, and Massey deserve. It's up to us to make this known. Please share.